This video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. Special thanks to them for supporting our documentaries and content for so long. Surfshark, of course, are one of the many VPN providers out there in the world that allow you to do all sorts of cool things when browsing the web, unblock region-locked content by spoofing your location to watch TV shows you otherwise wouldn't have access to, protect your IP address from being leaked on unsecure websites, and encrypt all your data, preventing your ISP or any other peeping toms from seeing what you're doing online. But unlike all the other VPN providers, Surfshark gives you the most bang for your buck. When you use Surfshark, you have access to features like the ability to use a single account subscription for an unlimited number of devices, something nobody else offers. Surfshark also has tons of other bonus features that you get access to with any subscription and if you sign up with the link in the description, along with using code GBay99 at checkout, you'll get 83% off your purchase, plus three months free, all while supporting our videos. Thanks again to Surfshark for supporting my channel and all the weird niche esports content we make. Okay, so today I want to share a story with you guys. This is something I've stumbled upon recently, almost completely by accident. Uh, it's a narrative about an individual in the world of esports who is one of the most weirdly inspiring people that I've ever seen before. But this is not a player or coach or analyst like you might expect. It's a commentator and one of the most iconic ones in all of League of Legends. I don't know if people are gonna find this as interesting as I do, but I wanna tell this story right. So let me go ahead and begin by rewinding back to the very start of all this. For the past few years now, I've been making documentaries on my YouTube channel about League of Legends. I've talked about its esports scene, its development history, and even a few infamous rioters in the past, which has been a really fun hobby turned job. Although there's one part of making these videos that can get a little bit tedious. I spend quite a bit of time watching replays of old league matches. If I'm doing a documentary on a particular player and their career, for instance, I want to describe what they were like as a player during their time with the game, what unique skills they had, what their weaknesses were, and of course I want to find moments of casters freaking out over their most impressive plays. But to do all of that properly, I have to go and actually spend quite a bit of time watching old pro VODs. This can be fun at first, being reminded nostalgically of what old league was like, but it can also get very mind-numbing very quickly. A huge portion of my day might consist of sifting through hours and hours of old games of league that I already know what's going to happen before I even begin watching. It's one of the less fun parts about video production, but recently I found one unexpected upside of this process. I've developed a really deep appreciation for League of Legends commentators. Since I spend so much time listening to them, I've started to get some kind of nuanced opinions on which casters I think do the best job of creating hype moments, or which ones are great at introducing player narratives, but of all the casters I've listened to throughout all the seasons of League, there's one who, in my opinion, is king above all others, and that is none other than David Freak Turley. Freak first got his start in competitive gaming with Warcraft 3, where he was a bit of a professional back in the day, but as time went on, he eventually wanted to get into some form of content creation. Eventually, he found himself commentating replays done by other Warcraft 3 professionals, where he would record audio explaining just what was going on in a match, gearing his casts towards newer players who could maybe learn a little bit from what they're seeing. I would typically recommend creeping the null uh, poachers first, simply because they die faster, and thus you get the skeletons out, and then you just use a little bit of micro to make them refocus so you don't take damage in your DR, you never know, it can matter. He became a bit of a figurehead in the Warcraft 3 community and began developing a knack for this kind of stuff, so much so that a few years later when Riot Games released League of Legends, Freak applied for an internship and was hired on as community manager. Ever since then, Freak has been with Riot doing a myriad of things for the company. He's always been engaging with the community on forums, he's produced the Champion Spotlight series, but by far the biggest thing that he's done, and the reason I want to talk about him today, is he is one of Riot's oldest and most successful shout Casters. As I said at the start of this video, I honestly feel like Freak is one of the most weirdly inspiring people in all of esports, as funny as that is to say out loud. His narrative, though, and the casting career he's had, is a very underappreciated storyline that we're going to be taking a look at. And to showcase exactly what I'm talking about, we're going to be looking at three separate shout casting jobs he's done over the years. One cast he did back in Season 1, 2011 Worlds, one at the beginning of the LCS era in Season 3, 
2013. And then we'll also take a look at a cast he's done this most recent year in 2021 of season 11. The specific games I've chosen have been picked pretty much completely at random. I knew I specifically wanted a Worlds cast he did in Season 1 because that was pretty much the only high-profile event of Season 1, but other than that, I'm not, I'm not trying to purposefully select his most exciting casts or the worst ones he's done or anything like that to create a narrative out of thin air. I just genuinely think that Freak and his story over the years is one of the most interesting narratives there, there are in esports. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into game number one. This first game comes from Season 1 Worlds, where Freak is casting a group stage match between CLG from North America and Gamed DE from Europe. This is after Freak's been officially casting league matches for a little while now, but you can still see he's pretty new to this. I guess we're getting conflicting reports on who's actually being played. Uh, certainly Gamed is going to be playing, they can just kind of stay there for now. Uh, but yeah, we were told, you know, originally the schedule was Team Solo Mid, then it was like, no, it's going to be CLG, then it was like, no, it's back to the normal, but now Tyler's saying, well, actually, uh, CLG's game, uh, oh, this is, yeah, CLG game is going forth, so, uh, yes, we're gonna do, uh, game, CLG. One thing worth mentioning about Freak is, during this point of his career, he was almost more of a pro player than a caster. Throughout Season 1, he was one of the higher-rated North American players in League of Legends, and frequently played with and against professionals whenever he queued up for solo queue. Honestly, he was probably talented enough to play as a pro if he wasn't working for Riot, but this was a bit of a detriment to his shoutcasts. If you ever listened to Freak during these years, you probably remember how he would often spend time zeroing in on really specific things that didn't really matter a lot, like mentioning every time a player would miss CS in game. And, and he's gonna be in, in good shape as it still moves on. Chaps are gonna try to last hit right there. Misses that one, unfortunately. The reason he was doing this, though, was because he was a player. And when you play League of Legends, that's the stuff you focus on. What minion you're CSing next. Every time you miss CS. Who's ahead in CS? A lot of this game is paying attention to CS. Freak was almost trained to focus in on this kind of stuff, just through virtue of how much he played League of Legends. And this made a lot of his early casts really rough around the edges. He spent a lot of time mentioning various different information that was relevant to the game. But a lot of the stuff he said wasn't really info that served the broadcast by contributing to the narrative. It was just a stream of consciousness info dump. If Sona had, you know, her passive proc or another Q available, that would have been the first blood right away picked up, but uh, still the advantage, 500 gold now in game's favor. They're doing great for themselves. Swain still camping out in mid. A uh, hotshot, there we go, is going to turn on that giant crow form. We're getting a little bit of free health there, last hitting a few of these minions. Uh, the way that ultimate works, actually, is it costs more mana to maintain over time, so you kind of want to pulse it for a little bit, gain a little bit of health, and let it go back down. Uh, and that's kind of the most mana-efficient way to gain health. He's pulsing in there, going to last hit a few more minions. Freak was still clearly at a learning point in his career where he was learning how to communicate important information to an audience effectively, and he was also learning how to speak in a professional way. If you listen to a lot of his early casts here, he oftentimes sounds a little bit stiff or robotic or sometimes a bit timid. Yeah, wow, and it's great. He's like, okay, there's a fight. Oh, gosh, watch out. Oh, no, wait, someone's lying bottom. Wait, switch over. And I'm actually... So really someone's on the headset telling me when to look at a different lane, otherwise I'd miss all of those for those of you who know my commentating. So thank you very much for those who are helping. I'm actually managing to follow the fights this time. Uh, and the stream is less mad at me because of that, so. But by far my favorite thing about Freak was during this period of time, anytime he was commentating action in game, he would just sort of raise his voice a little bit louder as if that would be what hyped the crowd up. No real quote on that one. Looks like uh, in the end though, Vladimir, oh, here comes the push on the Candy Panda. They're taking a ton of damage as the Sona Dance. He has dropped down, now pushing on save. He's getting pushed back around a little bit. Zarlar's staying alive, but that was one pretty much free kill. Great coordination with the ultimates there. This quirk in particular is something I find really endearing because this is basically what every YouTuber goes through. Whenever you first get into public speaking, be that on the internet or with an actual live audience that you're talking to, you go through this weird little adventure where you try to find your voice because in your head you know that you should be doing something to project more. You should be projecting your voice so everyone can hear, speaking with good diction, with a clear and concise tone from the diaphragm and all that kind of stuff. But you don't know how to do that. So you just kind of experiment and oftentimes it results in really funny examples like the very first YouTube video I ever made. Hello YouTube, this is GBay99 and today I'm going to be showing you how much elo you can actually gain from playing only one champion in solo queue. 
It's actually a weirdly difficult thing to do, speaking to a large audience where you are projecting your voice and talking in a clear and concise manner, while also making it sound completely natural. That's the hard thing. It's really difficult to like read a script or something and have it come out as if you're just talking in a regular conversation, as if people don't realize that what they're hearing is scripted. And so maybe I shouldn't be super harsh on Freak for his voice getting a little louder when he's commentating exciting moments, but there's actually another reason that Freak maybe struggled a bit early on in his career. Because honestly, Freak was asked to do something that nobody in the world of broadcasting is ever asked to do. Anytime you listen to a broadcast from something like a sports game, you'll always hear two different types of casters, play-by-play -play and color. The play-by-play -play commentator is the primary speaker. Their job is to describe action as it happens in relatively simple terms, but with lots of energy and gusto to get the audience watching excited. Normally, play-by-play -play commentators are traditional media figures, someone who went to school for broadcasting and has a professional-sounding voice, but they still get to be the person freaking out at the exciting moments as they occur. Think of someone like Quickshot in the LEC or Captain Flowers in the LCS. The color commentator is the other kind of person that you'll hear during the game who's normally responsible for filling in during downtime. Their job is to provide expert level analysis and context for what's going on, be that with statistics, describing strategies, or other background information. Normally, that means color commentators are ex-professionals or sometimes coaches or analysts, but they're always someone that has a really high-level understanding of what's going on in-game so they can explain it to the audience. The way things typically play out between these two is the play-by-play -play caster will describe an exciting thing as it happens, whereas the color commentator will then step in, maybe with a replay, and describe why that just happened, what each team was trying to do, the strategies they were using, and why everything unfolded the way it did. The the reason this is significant is in those early days of League, Freak was saddled with both jobs. During pretty much every one of his casts, he was meant to be both the play-by-play -play commentator and the color commentator. He was meant to do color commentary because he was pretty much the most knowledgeable person there was in shoutcasting when it came to League of Legends strategy. He was the closest thing that Riot had to a retired pro who could break down the high-level concepts of in-game strategy for an audience, so that was naturally Freak's responsibility when he was going into casts. But he was also kind of meant to be the play-by-play -play commentator as well. He was an official Riot employee. He was kind of meant to be the primary broadcaster, casting the action and getting everyone excited about League, almost as if he was a promoter or something. So I guess what all this means is I shouldn't have been so hard on him for whatever goofy foibles Freak maybe had in his first year of casting. He was saddled with more responsibility than anyone is ever given in the world of broadcasting. Having to do both of these jobs that normally are just reserved for one person apiece, that's really difficult, and Freak was able to do surprisingly well given the workload he had. But thankfully for Freak, as time went on, more people got into casting League of Legends. There were more color commentators who came into the scene as old pros began retiring and more analysts joined, as well as more play-by-play -play commentators who were really excited to be a part of the game, and this ended up making Freak's job a whole lot easier. The next match I want to show you comes from the 2013 LCS Spring Split, where we're watching Team Marn up against Team Dignitas. Here, Freak is doing commentary alongside Jat, an ex-pro who is the former jungler for Team Dignitas, and a color caster. Now, as hard as it must have been for Freak to do both jobs early on in his career, it might have actually been a bit of a blessing in disguise. At this point in 2013, he's now able to focus on just one responsibility and improve it that as time goes on. But something interesting to note, because he is now pretty experienced with both styles of commentary, he's able to hop between them. In this game we're looking at, Freak is the play-by-play -play commentator, and here in Champion Select, his job as the play-by-play -play guy is to really just announce things as they happen, maybe talk about each champion briefly as they're locked in, but then defer to Jat and let him answer any questions about the strategies that each team is employing and kind of prodding him for information. But because Freak is such a knowledgeable player himself and really understands quite a bit, he's able to have a really natural back and forth conversation with Jat about everything that we're seeing and even crack a few jokes. Whoa, I was I would I was gonna say Kogma. That's not a Kogma. That's All right, that is Corky. Yeah, that's one of the oh. other comfort picks for him, of course. I mean, way back in the day, he'd rush the Black Cleaver on it, 
uh, and tripled Doran's Blade and just brawled people all the time. That was with the old Black Cleaver, too. The yeah. one that was like 15 armor shred on hit stacks up to three times. And mm -hmm. you're like, Cutie Pie, that's not a good build. He's like, we do it because it works. <laughs> it's like, you've got to think about <laughs> stuff. for you. But I don't Cutie Pie just... He doesn't need to think, and he's successful. So yeah, he just he just kind of goes like me. if you ever watch Cutie Pen a team fight, he'll just pick brawl at every single opportunity. Eighty percent of the time it works. <laughs> yeah. Twenty percent of the time he flashes to die. You can see there's still a little bit of dead air and a bit of awkwardness, but this is really impressive. Freak is providing a really dynamic voice that you don't get to see that often when you watch any kind of sports commentary. He's finding ways to mesh his historical and in-game knowledge to whatever's happening on screen and providing a second voice that you normally don't see because normally there's just one color caster for each individual game. I assume from Jet's point of view, this makes his job even easier and allows for more back and forth discussion. Freak is able to develop some really solid synergy with his co-commentator in this game now that he's not responsible for everything as well. And Crumbs, uh, no, the smite actually did go to Crumbs. He did pick that one up. Clicky D now in a bad spot. Mega going to get the taunt. Knocked into the air. Well, they have the damage exhaust going off into Clicky D. Flashes away from almost everybody. Look how low he is, but Mega Zero taking damage from Kiwi Kid. Clicky D's coins are out. First blood. Clicky D picks it up. There's the repel from Elise. Kiwi Kid still on top of that team. Mega Zero's taunt should be up very, very soon. Oh. He just uses it. Flashes away from Kiwi. You can tell that he's getting better. I mean, it's slight, but there is an improvement here. Freak still kind of sounds like he's just raising his voice to exclaim when exciting things happen rather than feeling genuine excitement himself, but I'm believing more of what I'm hearing, and I feel like Freak is really starting to find his own voice. A lot of magic just on him. There's the pressure. Look at the ignite on him. Knocked into the air as well. Tries to taunt crumbs and run away. Can he get enough? No, he's not going to nearly get away from that one. 130 gold for the assist, 260 for the kill. Nice gank. He certainly improved a lot at this point in his career, but let's go ahead and skip forward to our third and final game in 2021 to hear what Freak's shoutcasts sound like today. Let's go for a late invade. They will find the binding. There's not going to be a lot of follow-up. They can't kill him, but they might uh, force Sword out to a very bad base, but a hook back into Vulcan means quite a bit of damage, but now Lost is probably going to be forced to flash late game here. Another bind comes through. Big damage. They're going to find Speak for first blood as the team is still fighting back and forth. Two for nothing. Oh no, the jungle, I believe, actually helped to kill off yeah. Vulcan, but you take a two for one first blood and a red buff steal. That difference is incredible. Listen to how much more confident Freak is with his voice, how natural his commentary sounds, hear his cadence and how much genuine excitement he can now express and communicate to listeners. I mean, Freak himself is probably the only one who can fully appreciate how far he's come, but it's really incredible where he is now compared to where he was 10 years ago. There we go. Forces the flash and the power of evil, and who needs to get the damage in? But they still got snipes coming across. Mega Dart into the wall. That's a pick, and it's right in front of Baron. That's in 30 seconds. Only one inhib is down, but they just one shot perks. He had flash up, and it didn't matter. This is sort of now reaching the back line. They're gonna just pick off Sven, and they don't even need a mid. TSM's good with that one. Fudge can only run away. A triple kill already for Lost. He wants the fourth. It's gonna be no problem. Huni will not steal it, and all that's left is Vulcan. Where is he even going to go? Sword out going to oh, try to lock gonna the man the down. They're oh! going to give him the Penta. Change his name. It's TSM Wondered. But wait a second. This might seem obvious to you. Like, yeah, people get better at things the more they do them. That's just a natural part of being a human being, right? And that's a fair point. But I would argue normally we aren't given this kind of opportunity when it comes to the world of employment. Normally, if you are hired for a job, you are not given extended periods of time to find yourself. If you're hired for a job, you are normally hired because you're supposed to be qualified for it, and then once you learn the ins and outs of that job, you are expected to deliver on the work. And if you don't, you will be let go. That's doubly so for super cutthroat industries like the world of sports or the world of entertainment or the world of broadcasting. I mean, think about all the LCS teams out there who will immediately fire coaches or cut players the instant they don't start rising up the standings after a new signing. Freak definitely wasn't the worst shoutcaster back in 2011. He still had a lot of bright moments like we mentioned earlier, but I would say he probably wasn't ready to be a professional broadcaster. Like if you take 20 2011 Freak and you stick him in the world today, if he goes off and applies for any number of sports commentary jobs, I don't know if he gets hired. But with that being said, it's really cool that Riot took a chance on him. 
and allowed him to grow and improve as the years went on. I mean, it kind of took years for Freak to get as good as he is today, but now he sounds like he's an entirely different human being compared to back in 2011. You know, I would probably say that Freak might be the best caster in esports, just in terms of his skill set. I don't think there's anyone else out there that can hop between play-by-play -play and color commentary the way that he can. You know, there might actually not be anyone that has that skill set in any sport. Freak's story kind of serves as a reminder that we should be patient with people. That it's okay if someone's not immediately good at something they start off doing. That doesn't mean that they can't grow and get better at that thing as time goes on if they're given the chance. I mean, he serves as a reminder to me that even if I struggle with something when I first start doing it, that doesn't mean that I can't improve and get better as time goes on and hopefully become great at it one day. It's a weirdly motivational thing. I never really thought about this before. Freak is just a really great and impressive guy, man. I'm, I'm glad that League of Legends has him, and I hope you enjoyed this little little trip down memory lane in this video. Thank you very much for watching and making it all the way to the very end. Thanks, of course, to my patrons for supporting me and helping me make weird videos like this. Uh, thank you very much to anyone who's watching this or subscribed to the channel and allows me to do this kind of stuff. And thank you very much to you, Freak, if you are out there somewhere listening to this video. You do a great job, man, with what you do, and I'm, I'm glad that League of Legends has you. Anyway, though, on that note, I will see you all in our next video, but until then, thanks again for watching, good luck in solo queue, and have a wonderful day.